Once a year, you and I spin the wheels of a huge and efficient machine. We send in our federal income tax returns and hope that Uncle Sam finds them in order. More than 60 million individual and business returns pour into the 64 district offices of the Internal Revenue Service every year. Massive evidence that our voluntary system of tax collection really works. For most of us, that's the end of the story. But for the Internal Revenue Service, the job, a year-round job, rolls into high gear. Let's take a look at the size of this tax-collecting job. The Internal Revenue Service performs the huge task of collecting over $50 billion of income taxes every year at a phenomenally low cost to us, less than 40 cents for each $100 collected. The successful operation of this vast tax collection process depends on the voluntary cooperation of all of us millions of taxpayers who literally assess ourselves for the tax we pay, and also on the work of accountants, lawyers, and other professional tax experts who help individuals and business enterprises with their tax problems, which often include complicated accounting problems in determining taxable income. Let's see how well this cooperation of taxpayers, independent experts, and the government actually works. This block represents all of the income tax returns received by the government in a recent year. Only this comparatively small number, about four in a hundred, require any adjustment. More than half of the cases which have to be adjusted result from minor mistakes, which can usually be corrected by letter. And nine out of ten of the cases which require personal discussion with the Internal Revenue Service are settled after an informal conference between a revenue agent and the taxpayer or the taxpayer's representative. A very small number, less than one-tenth of one percent, require further discussion. These few cases which remain unsettled after a conference with the revenue agent can be taken up with the agent's group chief or with the appellate division of the Internal Revenue Service. And out of all the millions of tax returns, only about 2,000 each year end up in the tax court or a federal district court. Most of us who file returns year after year never have any trouble. But what happens when the government does disagree with one of us about the amount of tax due? For example, when the Revenue Service questions a deduction. I uh, was pretty upset when the revenue agent told me that he couldn't allow a deduction of $950 that I'd claimed on my income tax return. My uh, friend, Jimmy Johnson uh, suggested that you might be able to straighten things out for me. Well, just what was the deduction that's giving you trouble? Expenses of a business trip to Florida. In the winter? Sure. My customer lives there. I closed a big deal. You'll notice I reported a $2,500 commission I made on it. The Internal Revenue Service always takes an extra look at expenses for business trips to resort areas. How long did it take you to close the deal? A week. Well, of course, the actual deal only required a few hours, but my customer is a pretty busy man. But do you have a detailed record of what you spent? Well, no, not exactly. Uh, here's my checkbook. You'll uh, find an entry here, a transportation. Ah, here we are, $160. Hotel, $295. Murder. And uh, $500 cash I drew just before I left. Believe me, I didn't have $10 when I came back. Well, I'm afraid the government won't accept your checkbook as proof that the $500 was spent for a business purpose. We'll have to see how much of it we can justify, then we'll talk to the revenue agent, and I think we can make a reasonable settlement. But the, the whole trip was on business. Well, you can't expect the government to let you deduct as much as you feel like spending any time you make a business trip. Now, let's see. I suppose you did entertain your customer while you were there? Oh, sure. After they have reconstructed the expense account, it's presented to the revenue agent. So here's the story, Mr. Cassidy. In addition to travel and hotel, Mr. Barrett took his client to lunch and to dinner twice, and he gave a small party for some other people who were interested in the deal. Mm -hmm. 
He paid cash, but uh, I got this photostat of the check for it from his hotel. Altogether, $225 for business entertainment. I actually spent nearly $500. Well, on the basis of this new evidence, I guess we can allow the $225, in addition to the transportation and hotel expenses. I'll refigure the tax and give you the papers to sign in a couple of minutes. Approximately 700,000 cases are resolved each year by informal conferences with a revenue agent. More complicated problems which cannot be settled with either the revenue agent or the group chief may be taken to the appellate division of the Internal Revenue Service. Here's Jeff Armstrong, a small toy manufacturer, who is asking a CPA to help him present his case to the appellate staff. I may be crazy, Mr. Matthews, but George and I can't see why the government won't let me deduct the loss they admit I had. Well, as I understand it, Mr. Armstrong, the problem is when you can deduct it. Now, you claim the loss occurred when an order for $10,000 worth of toy automobiles was canceled on December 1st, 1952. Now, the government says the loss actually occurred when you sold them in March, 1953. For 10 cents on the dollar. Well, the Revenue Service is bound to argue about it because it means several thousand dollars difference in your tax bill if you deduct the loss in 1952, when you had a big year, instead of 1953, which wasn't so good. Don't I know it. If I have to pay a big extra tax now on my 1952 income, I'll be sunk. We've been handling it the same way every year, Mr. Matthews. Leftover Christmas merchandise just isn't worth much. Well, if we can prove that, we may be able to convince the Revenue Service. Why couldn't you have sold the merchandise the next Christmas? <laughs> you may know taxes, Mr. Matthews, but you don't know toy automobiles. Kids want the latest models, just like their dads. Well, what happens now? I'll reconstruct the record of losses on unsold Christmas merchandise in previous years. And I think that'll give me a good case to present to the appellate division. So far as I can see, Armstrong is trying to transfer a loss that occurred on a sale in March 1953 back to his 1952 return. Yes, but the loss actually did occur on December 1st, 1952, when a big order was canceled. You mean to tell me that this merchandise, which was worth $10,000 on December 1st was only worth $1,000 one month later. But you have to remember that this was Christmas merchandise. He used exactly the same basis for writing down the value of his year-end inventory in each of the four previous years. There was never any objection before. In the previous years, it didn't make any significant difference. But in 1952, the figures seriously distort his taxable income. Mr. Hayes, you're an accountant. And you know that one of the basic principles of inventory valuation is using the same method from one year to the next. Sure, but I can't accept a figure pulled out of a hat or from a sale that took place three months after the end of the tax year. How do we know that he couldn't have come out with a 50% loss if he had sold in January? I've got the figures here to prove it. Now, you know that if an inventory loss is clearly indicated by previous experience, sound accounting has to show it when the books are closed at the end of the year. I can't quarrel with that. Okay. Now, these figures show that over the four previous years, Armstrong's average loss on leftover Christmas merchandise was 80%. It didn't matter if he sold in January, February, or March. Well, that sounds more like a case. Any independent CPA examining Armstrong's financial statements for 1952 would have insisted that his inventory be written down at least 80%. I think you'll agree that that write-down is sound accounting for tax purposes. If his case had been presented that way to begin with, I don't think he would have had all this trouble. Fine. Now, if you let him take the 80% loss for 1952, I think he'll agree to take the rest of it in 1953. That'll add about $300 to his tax for the two years. Well, the facts will have to be reviewed before I can give you a final answer, but it sounds about right to me. Thanks. Thanks very much. All right. Nice seeing you again. Nice to see you. The appellate division of the Internal Revenue Service settles most of the cases which are not resolved with a revenue agent or his group chief. But occasionally there are problems which the taxpayer and the Internal Revenue Service cannot settle by conference. These cases are likely to end in court. Martha, the government refuses to accept the partnership that you and I formed when John died. So they say that our tax returns are wrong. We've got to decide whether we'll take the case to court. Well, I don't want to go to court. 
You've been our family lawyer for 20 years, Lewis. And you know I've never been accused of doing anything illegal before. I don't like it. But you aren't accused of doing anything illegal, Martha. The government hasn't charged you with fraud. It's just a question of how much tax is due. Well, that's why we have a certified public accountant. He tells me how much tax I owe and I pay it. It isn't always quite that simple. I figure your tax on the basis of the agreement made with Mr. Cole before your husband died. But I can't persuade the Revenue Service that you are now a real partner in place of your husband. That's why I suggested you ought to talk to Mr. Jordan. I drew up this new partnership agreement between you and Mr. Cole just the way your husband planned it with him. And I think it's perfectly valid. Of course, you don't take any active part in managing the business, so I can't guarantee that this partnership will be accepted by a court for tax purposes. John and I had a perfectly simple understanding, Martha, and I don't see why there should be any question about it. We were equal partners. We agreed that when either of us died, his widow should have a one-third partnership, and the surviving partner two-thirds, as long as he managed the business. You understand that in a partnership, each partner pays income tax on his personal share of the income they make together. Now, we've filed income tax returns for three years on the basis of your partnership with Mr. Cole. But now the Revenue Service says that you are not really partners, that he's just paying you for your husband's share of what the business was worth. Well, what difference does that make? Well, quite a lot of difference in taxes. If your agreement with Mr. Cole is not recognized as a genuine partnership, he would have to pay taxes on all of the income from the business in the last three years. Now, that means he would owe the government about $20,000 additional taxes. Of course, you would be entitled to a refund. I'd probably die of the shock. But that wouldn't be fair. I, I, I don't want more than I'm entitled to under the agreement my husband made. Why couldn't I collect the refund and turn it over to him? Unfortunately, your refund would be a good deal less than Mr. Cole's additional taxes because his income would be pushed up into the higher brackets. It doesn't seem right. We know this was an honest arrangement, but we can't blame the Internal Revenue Service for questioning it because many partnerships are actually shams for tax evasion. I'll pay the extra tax and you take the refund on the taxes you've paid. No. I won't have it that way. I don't care what the government says. I'm not going to take advantage of a technicality to get more than my fair share out of my husband's business. <laughs> You're just like John. I suppose that's part of the trouble. We always trusted each other so completely that we didn't bother about legal details in our partnership. Oh, that's... Oh, I know we were wrong, but uh, we thought it wasn't important at the time. What would happen if we go to court and lose? As I have it figured, there would be a net additional tax of about $9,000 after subtracting the refund which would be due to you. Well, Lewis, what do you advise us to do? I can't promise that you would win the case, but we know that this particular partnership agreement was made in good faith. Then I think we should have confidence in the courts. You agree, Gordon? If you want it that way, Martha, and I'll guarantee that you won't have any reason to regret your decision. Only a few tax returns involve problems that have to be settled in court. Remember that 96 tax returns out of 100 involve no problem. A majority of the remaining 4% require minor adjustments usually settled by mail. Most of the rest are settled by an informal conference with an internal revenue agent, a group chief, or the appellate division of the Internal Revenue Service, where the taxpayer can be represented by a certified public accountant, a lawyer, or any other person who is enrolled to practice before the Treasury Department. But whether his problem is simple or complicated, the taxpayer knows that in its smooth and efficient collection of taxes, the government also protects the rights of every business and every individual who pays a tax. Thank you.